ready to get serious about building content sites and building a profitable business online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online asset. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today, we've got a special guest, Vic Dorfman. Now, Vic runs a WordPress membership agency called Memberfix. So he specializes in the tech side of building your own membership. But we dive into this podcast more than just the tech you need. We actually dive into, you know, why you should choose a membership or why you why you would go down a membership route with your website. What stage of your website's growth would you choose to go to, uh, into a membership? Are there any advantages or disadvantages? What you can offer as part of your membership to make it more valuable for your customers? And various tactics you can use to help reduce um, churn and increase the lifetime value for your members. But then we also switch tact. So Vic and I have done a JV or a joint venture partnership um, on a niche website together. And we cover a lot of things with uh, joint ventures regarding things like why you would even go down this route, why you would give equity to someone else of your own essentially asset. How would you go about it? How you would find someone? I mean, why would you split this equity or you know, would you just pay someone to essentially run your site and when it would be appropriate to do that? We also cover some, I guess, a more controversial side of it with uh, regarding giving equity away to a writer as well. And we cover some um, areas of interest regarding you know, when you would want to do that and when it might be applicable to do something like that. So enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Niche Website Builders, an agency dedicated to helping people just like you build profitable content sites. Niche Website Builders are the hands-off content site marketing agency you always wished existed. It's run by content site marketers for content site marketers, and they help both investors and individuals alike build profitable online properties. They provide a fully outsourced approach to content creation, link building, and done-for-you website builds, the same approach they use on their own six-figure portfolios. For example, their content packages come with a proprietary keyword research process, are written by in-house native English speakers, formatted using templates proven to convert, and uploaded to WordPress with affiliate links added so that all you need to do is hit the publish button. Check them out at nichewebsite.builders slash show. That's nichewebsite.builders slash show and fill out the form to get coupon codes for 10% more content or a 10% discount on links with your first order sent right to your inbox. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today we've got Vic Dorfman. How are you going, Vic? Hey, James. How's it going? Oh, not too bad. Just for the people who aren't quite sure of who you are, can you just give us a quick background um, of your skill set and essentially what you're doing within, I guess, the SEO or digital marketing realm and, and a little bit about your membership agency. Sure. So I'm Vic Dorfman, I'm the founder of Memberfix, and we are a digital agency where we help to set up and support membership websites, specifically WordPress membership websites. Perfect. So I want to actually jump into a little bit of membership stuff. This is, I guess, From a selfish standpoint, this actually quite interests me a lot in terms of being able to sell and market your own essentially digital products or your own membership where you can actually retain a lot of the margin versus say affiliate marketing or digital advertising. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to dive a little deeper for the the people listening as well. Why would you choose a membership over um, selling one-off products? Is there an advantage to doing that or any disadvantages? Yeah, there are advantages and disadvantages, I would say. Obviously, the advantage is that you're getting recurring revenue. And the disadvantage is that it's really quite a lot of work. And you have to be able to provide value on a consistent basis such that people are willing to give you money on a consistent basis. So it's I would say it's it's all good as long as you have enough content and you have enough uh, value that you can provide to your community or to your membership on an ongoing basis and um 
one-off products are great and they have a place in your funnel. You know, a lot of times they'll be like uh, a, uh, what you might call it, like a trip wire, you know, or so- sometimes it's not appropriate to have a membership as let's say your lead magnet, right? Or as your one-time offer in your funnel. So the membership, um, if, if we kind of zoom out and look at the membership component component of your business as let's say part of the Ryan Dice style funnel, well, I think they call it profit maximizer, then it's just the type of offer that you need in your business from sort of a mechanical business uh, point of view. But of course, it, it comes along with its own vagaries and there's definitely a lot of work involved. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and I assume a, a lot of, I guess, companies or websites come to you to help implement their membership site. Do you, from your experience, do you see, you know, what, what stage these websites are in before they look to implement membership, or implement membership websites? Are they brand new websites just looking to start their membership or are they already established with traffic? I would say most of our customers that we serve already have membership sites, but we do also have folks that come to us looking to start a brand new membership site. And I would say it's probably like 80, 20, as far as people who already have sites going and they just need some kind of help or implementation or custom coding. Nice. And then how would you go about, I guess, validating the idea in terms of say where you are with your website, whether a membership would be a good idea. Cause I, I can imagine, even for myself with my own websites, I've gone down that single product route because as you mentioned with one of the disadvantages of having a membership is that you need to constantly be bringing out content or constantly bringing out value to the customer. So how do you know then when it would be a good idea to be able to implement a membership with your niche site? You kind of don't, I think. You know, um, so like one thing that you could do, for example, if we're talking about niche sites, you can try an affiliate offer, right? And see how, so if, if we're talking about validating, okay, do I have a membership site that I could potentially build here that people would pay for and without diving in and spending a ton of time creating content and, and doing the setup, try like an affiliate offer, right? Cause it's a niche site. You're probably already doing some kind of affiliate stuff and see if it sells. Okay. If it sells, then maybe you have some form of validation, but if it doesn't sell, that also doesn't necessarily mean that if you did a membership site, that it wouldn't work. And I've seen kind of, um, I've seen people beat their head against the wall as far as they're just so determined to make their membership site and the beginnings are so slow, but after a while they somehow figure out, you know, their marketing or like, it's really hard, man. It's business, you know, it's like, it's, it's, um, like one of my really good friends, he has a, a watercolors painting academy with his wife and they've been at it for like a really long time and it's really slow going, but they're like, this is what we're doing. This is what we're going to do. And they just made up their mind that they're going to serve that community and they're going to make that membership site. And after I think it's been like two, two, three years, it's starting to finally gain traction. You know, they found the right marketing channel, like just the right angle on their sales page. They tried so much shit. It's unbelievable, um, their tenacity, but um, I don't know if niche site owners are generally gonna have the patience for, for that kind of thing. So I'd probably try to do some kind of affiliate marketing, see if people are interested in a general sense. And if they are, see what you can do to do a better job than what you were promoting as an affiliate as far as presentation, value, information, uh, whatever. Yeah, I think many, many people get caught up in the idea of monthly recurring revenue. Sounds great. I can make, you know, thousand dollars a month. That's semi guaranteed at least, but then forget that at the beginning, you're going to be making 10, $20 a month working your ass off for maybe a few members with the idea that eventually it might grow in one to two years. So it's a long slog compared to not so much instant gratification, but faster growth with just, you know, doing some affiliate or, or display advertising as well. 
totally. And let's not forget too, that if you're making a thousand bucks a month from one-off products, because let's say you have a traffic source that's consistent and converting it in, in a consistent way, that is recurring revenue. It's not like recurring revenue, but it is revenue that you are recurringly receiving. And that's totally legitimate. I mean, it's still money in your pocket. And, uh, but with none of the sort of hassles and none of the, uh, let's say like, uh, responsibilities associated with keeping a member happy, which is hard work. Have you had any, from a personal standpoint here, have you had any, uh, I guess, clients or any experience with people that maybe had, say, five or 10 different products or courses, and then decided to bundle them into a membership? Yes. Do, what, do you need to then still provide a lot of, because you've made the courses, you're selling them one off, if you bundle them together to a membership, I'm assuming then you now have to offer something else to keep people in the membership. I mean, there's so many ways to skin a cat as far as how to structure your offer and how to package the value that you're you're providing, right? So I think what happens a lot of times is that people start creating courses and ebooks and products and things like this. And then they realize they have this big mess on their hands. And then they also realize that they have a lot of content and a lot of value that they could present to their uh, audience. So they decide, okay, why don't I just put this all in a big soup and charge on a monthly basis for access. But then I've seen hybrid models where uh, one of our customers, they, uh, they tried a whole bunch of different things, but I think what they're currently doing or what they have a set up was uh, they did like the splintering system, right? So you can buy one off courses. Uh, it's in the crochet niche which crushes it, by the way, if you can believe it. Uh, you can purchase a, a one-off course. And then when you purchase the one-off course, you're basically upsold to the membership. And then when you're in the membership, you're constantly upsold to the membership. It's like, hey, don't you want all these crochet courses? Don't you really want to learn to crochet these booties or whatever that they're doing in there? And I think we have to separate like the, the marketing model from the content right? So you can take the same content and you can package it different ways and you can charge for it differently, but it's essentially the same content, right? Um, the question is, can you, can you justify doing so? And will, will your members pay? Uh, and will, will they get value that is at least proportional if ideally not a great deal more than what they're paying for? So I think that's the other thing to keep in mind is like, there is no answer. There's no really like good template. You're going to need to do some experimentation. Um, and, and it's totally fine to rip off your competitors in your niche and just be like, Oh, they already went through the trouble of figuring this out. Let me do what they're doing for a while and see if it works for me, or let me make some minor modifications. Um, you know? Yeah, that's some good advice. And I, I want to stick on this, on this, I guess this offer and giving value part, because obviously, as you mentioned, a membership can be a bunch of, you know, I guess whatever content you have, and whatever you want to give. So what what are some examples of, I guess, content that you've seen do well or back end things in a membership that that you believe essentially make a membership solid? Yeah, great question, James. So I would say that, okay, some of this will be counterintuitive or if you're in the online marketing space, maybe it'll make total sense. But most of the people who buy your membership, who join your membership, who buy anything from you, are not even going to consume it at all, like 0%. Like, and I've seen this bear out because on a, a lot of the membership sites, we're tracking like user activity and we see that, okay, out of a hundred people who bought the, the course or the membership, you know, I don't know, like five of them are interacting with the website in any meaningful way. And I mean, like I'm guilty. I think I bought uh, on, Two Black Fridays ago, I bought the Affiliate Lab, which I shared with you, the Diggity's course, which is amazing. It's like, you know, this this pinnacle of awesomeness in the SEO space that I didn't even use, man. I didn't even look at it, you know, and it was like a grand or something. Fuck, you know, what could I have done with that thousand bucks? Well, now we're using it, so it's all good. But yeah, so that's the first thing to keep in mind that uh, most most people won't even get in there um, or really, really get value. So, okay. So, but you do want the people who are in there to get maximum value. And, um, what I've found is that the actual static content, so your courses, your PDFs, your downloads, all that, this kind of thing is not the real 
draw as far as keeping people. It's a community of some kind. That's what really keeps people um, not canceling. Yeah, not, I wouldn't say it's what keeps people in. It's what keeps people from not from from canceling. Because every month you're like, do I really need to be paying this, you know, 30, 40, 50 bucks, whatever a month? And they're like, ah, you know, but I do get value from the community and we have some, I can ask questions there. And, and the only membership of which I'm s still a member, I think I canceled everything is uh, the membership academy, which is a great membership. So if you're in, into membership sites at all, join the membership academy. It's, it's amazing. Um, and the only reason I'm still a member is because of the community. Although they do have a lot of great courses and static content and stuff like that. So yes, to, to make it short and sweet, a community is really what keeps people engaged and what gives them value. And then also uh, another thing that I've seen a lot are like group coaching calls, right? Because, and here's another thing to keep in mind, if you're uh, really enthusiastic about a membership, or let's say like really optimistic without being uh, cynical yet, is people want access to you. Like if you're the, you know, if, especially if you're some kind of like a personality in your space, they're joining the membership to get a piece of you um, and they will expect their piece of you. So unless you make all those terms and expectations clear and you, you know, remove yourself from the business and from the branding of your business, you will, uh, you will wind up, you know, answering a lot of annoying, stupid questions, um, which is fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong but you will, um, it's not going to be what you think. You know, it's going to be like a really giant group babysitting session. Maybe depending on your, on your thing, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not disparaging it. Uh, it's a perfectly legitimate way to give value and, um, and make money. But it, you know, it, it depends. Like, is that what you want to do? Do you, do you find value in that? Mm, so yeah, a uh, long story short, the community, aspect and some kind of a group coaching situation is usually what keeps people engaged. Nice. I guess that leads us nicely into a little bit of, I guess, your expertise and your agency's expertise. And that is looking at the tech stack of setting up a membership. Now, obviously, you've got, I guess you've got some kind of all in one platforms, kind of like Kajabi, I guess you could consider a membership platform kind of just because the app they have and things. But what are then mm. key pieces of tech or you know plugins or do you even run it on wordpress when you're looking at uh, creating a membership i guess tech stack yeah well we work with wordpress i would say that's kind of our thing um not that we have to we've worked with kajabi and teachable and all of these a lot of third-party apps we, we can do that as well but generally we're people are approaching us to help them with wordpress right so so basically i would say be before isolating any particular tech stack that what you have to remember is that form follows function as in architecture so in the tech space world you're not just picking your tech stack in a vacuum you have certain things you want to do maybe you want to do some kind of gamification maybe you want to have a community or a forum maybe you want to have courses with progress and uh, that, that has uh, evaluations and so it really depends what you're trying to do but I, I will answer your question less glibly which is that if you're doing a general membership site then I really like member press which I think is we've been working with member press for a long time they're one of our partners uh, or we're one of sort of their qualified contractors and they're a great company. It's very well coded. It's very versatile. It's very extensible. So if you want to do some custom coding, you can do that. And out of the box, it just works well, walks you through like a wizard. Um, they have their own courses, um, platform, but then if you need something more full featured, you've got learn dash and, uh, you know, if you want to do gamification, Game of Press is really great. If you want to do a community, uh, Buddy Boss is really great. And so there's so many different um, pieces of tech. And I think actually I'll, I'll just bring up sort of a tangential point because it is important. And I think a lot of people don't realize this is that like when folks like, for example, if you came to us and you said, Vic, I'm going to build a membership site. You know, I want to do X, Y, Z. What tech stack do you recommend? What I would tell you is, well, OK, send me all your requirements and tell me everything you want to do. And um, then what I will say to you is, James, okay, so I'm going to need about an hour or maybe two hours to conduct an analysis. 
uh, which is basically, it's called discovery. This is a fancy term, but basically in order to help you pick what you need and in order to understand your requirements at a more than superficial level and give you uh, a reality fact-based estimate and uh, recommendation, I need to spend time to understand all those requirements, do some research, usually do some research and uh, put together some kind of a scope document with requirements, acceptance criteria, et cetera, that I can then present to you. This is called analysis and it requires expertise and therefore is a paid process. And I think a lot of, uh, even I didn't realize, we, we implemented analysis in 2021 with the help of a business consultant that we hired and it completely changed the, um, you know, the caliber of our collaborations and the outcomes we got for our customers. And sometimes folks come, and, and I, it's understandable because it's, it's not immediately obvious to somebody who isn't in the agency world that like, why would I pay for an estimate? You're not paying for an estimate and you shouldn't pay for an estimate. But I would be wary and skeptical of um, any agency or freelancer who's giving you, quote, like a free estimate because they're essentially incentivized to jam through those as quickly as possible. But if they're charging for that time and for that expertise, there's a certain level of accountability um, that happens and they're actually spending the time necessary to understand your project and ensure that you have a like a pleasant collaboration where they're not constantly asking for more money, changing the scope, you know, moving the goalpost and all this kind of crap that makes people just feel like they're stuck and want to get out of a collaboration, you know, at, at all costs. And they're, they're sort of being, um, you know, held hostage in a way. So I just wanted to bring up that point because this is an important thing to understand when you're about to spend thousands of dollars potentially to work with somebody is um, spend a little upfront to, to understand what you're doing. Um, that's a good point. If, if, say, someone wanted to bootstrap it themselves, what would you say would be, I guess, the minimum viable tech stack? Say, for example, I wanted a community just to be able to, like a forum kind of thing, to be able to communicate with everyone. Yeah. And there may be something where I want to host, say, a live group Q&A maybe once a month or something like that. What would be the minimum tech I would need to run just something like that? Oh, man, like, yeah, member press. And for the community, for like for the forum, it could be anything. It could be like WP four O, just like a like a free WordPress forum. It's not going to be beautiful, you know, but it'll be serviceable, and you can always upgrade later to to you know Envision community or some or Buddy Boss or something. And for the calls like Zoom, just just yeah, send an email, be like, hey guys, we're hopping on Zoom. You know, put it in the members area. Hey guys, here's the Zoom link for this week or for this month easy simple so for everyone out there thinking about starting a membership now there's no excuses easy tech stack there pretty much free hosted on your wordpress and a bit of zoom i wanted to jump i guess switch a little bit um, on the topic so vic and i have kind of have jv'd essentially joint ventured on a project recently so we're going to talk a little bit more about niche websites is the fist bump through the camera so I'm going to talk a little bit more on niche sites, right. <laughs> um, digital marketing websites and things like that. And I think this will be of interest to many of you maybe who are looking to sell or exit your websites, or maybe you don't want to sell, but you still want to be able to essentially have your websites churning over and making you money. So mm. let's start with, I guess, you know, why would you go about, I guess, going or starting or finding someone for a JV partnership? And then how would you go about doing it? Well, in the case of me partnering with you and our collaboration and with our writer as well, I had this uh, niche website for like two years or something, actually probably longer, I think for like four or five years um, back when I was trying to do like Amazon niche sites. And the site at, at that point, uh, it's, so it's basically like reviewing um, like, 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 what is it? A hardware, I guess, like tech hardware. And um back when i started the site i didn't have any links all i had was content like long tail keywords and it was making money just from that i was writing the content myself and i was like oh okay this is great and then google came along and did a manual review and busted me for thin affiliate content which fair enough it was thin affiliate content there was nothing informational or you know value adding there it was just like blah blah blah, blah. check price blah, blah 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 check price you know and then um <clears throat> I think last year I decided, let me start over on an expired domain and let me try to build the site again because I already validated the fact that it makes money without doing any 
uh, backlinking without doing any SEO, has a ton of long tails in this niche. Okay, great. So let me, I, I let it just churn some, some money out. So I bought the expired domain and then I got super busy with my agency, which blew up and we've got our hosting, we've got all sorts of stuff happening. And I just didn't have time to work on it. Meanwhile, it's basically a, a diamond ready to be mined. You know, it's like, it's just sitting there. Uh, so I decided, okay. Um, and, and this is kind of like, as a more general thing, you know, once you start getting really busy, you have a lot on your, on the go, you, you know, you've got all these different business ventures. Thank, thank God for the opportunities that we get, but you will come to a point where like the only way to scale your time, uh, it doesn't matter how productive you are, right. Is going to be like to have some kind of, um, income producing assets, you know, whether it's like niche sites, crypto or whatever, but even all of that stuff requires maintenance. Like it's not passive. Like, uh, you know, maybe somebody somewhere out there has like real passive income. None of my income has ever been truly, uh, passive, you know, it still requires some kind of maintenance. So anyway, um, I thought, okay, well, maybe I can come up with some kind of a creative partnership to own a piece of this site, let other folks do the work of like growing it and building it and monetizing it. And then I'll still keep a piece of it, but they'll get the majority of it because they're doing most of the work. And I'll essentially provide the, you know, what's, what is the capital, uh, or the initial funding in the form of the website and all the backlinks and equity, uh, sweat equity that I had put in via the articles. And, uh, you know, they'll get an opportunity. We'll get to collaborate. Um, I'll get to, you know, get some percentage of something instead of all of nothing and everybody kind of wins, you know? Um, so this is, you know, what you and I decided to do. And I think it's a great model. In fact, I'm doing the same exact model on two other businesses because I just don't have time. And, th and the other thing too, is like, let's say you have like two or three such partnerships where you're essentially doing the same thing in all the partnerships. You have an economy of scale because like, you know, I'm handling like the legal, the accounting, all of this stuff that I don't think anybody really wants to do anyway. So I get, I have my little niche where they're like, oh, Vic, please handle that. Great. Um, and then if you're doing that, you know, in one business, then you are doing it in the second business. It's like, oh, okay, I just did this. It's fresh in your mind. It's like, it's, it's not this huge switching cost and everybody, it's a division of labor question basically. Right. Uh, um, John Locke kind of thing, John Locke, John Smith. No, exactly. But, so um, then if, if you're partnering with someone, how do you, how do you decide equity? value essentially so if you're just partnering with someone to operate the site how are you deciding you know essentially the equity split is there a general rule of thumb that you go by or you know is it just all negotiable this is a very difficult question and i've been in a lot of different uh partnerships and prospective partnerships and we've even tried doing in, in multiple instances slicing pie which is uh so if you go to slicingpie.com it's billed as a perfectly fair equity split where you essentially track all your time, all your inputs, you attach a fair market value to your time and your expertise and your resources that you're bringing to the table. And then at the end, you, you know, bake this pie, uh, and you sort of determine in a perfectly fair way who gets what based on their inputs, which, uh, works. It works. It's a, it's a real thing. Uh, but it is incredibly cumbersome. And, and, and it also requires every member of the team to be very conscientious as far as like tracking their time. Uh, like, like it's just so much work to just get it going that, um, even though I really love the idea and, and it does work in, in practice as well with the right people at the end of the day, what I've discovered is that a fair equity split is whatever everybody feels is fair. And, uh, even though it's not going to be fair in the technical sense of whatever your inputs are valued at on the fair market. And that's what you get. That's true. It's, it's going to be clunky, but as far as everybody feeling okay with the split and it's, and actually let, let me even zoom out on that. I'll say before you even enter into any of, of these kinds of things, you need to really like vet people and spend some good time talking with them and getting a feel for them, doing some kind of trial work together, because some people are really good at front loading their value proposition and they uh, sound really good and they sound competent, but, and they're even really good at, at, at um, appearing uh, honest 
you know they're they're good at appearing like they're like straight shooters but then they're not performing and you're like well, wait a minute and then every time you get on the phone you're they're, they're sort of glib and stuff and like there's a lot of bullshit that you have to you essentially have to get really good at reading people i think and um and just like seeing through people's nonsense i think that's like the 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 uh what would you call it? like the mega hack that is required to do this kind of thing successfully because uh, you're essentially doing like you know, low level M and A. And so, okay, you want to make sure the people you're collaborating with aren't going to screw you. Uh, you know, once you put together an operating agreement, it's like, okay, uh, if this person stops doing their work, okay, that means I have to like, you know, litigate. There's like, it's like, if you just have trust between your partners and you guys are all cool with what you're doing and you're all on the same page, as far as your roles, responsibility, approximately how much time you're, you're, uh, bringing to the project. And, and, and there's this feeling like, I think you have to kind of listen to your body too. It's like, am I getting like a wanky feeling from this person? Like, you know, are my shoulders tensing when I'm, I'm, I'm totally serious. Like your body knows well ahead of your mind and really like listening to your body is, uh, a, an amazing tool set to have when you're, um, talking with people and trying to get a sense of people because it's going to know before your mind does. And then later on, you're going to be like playing it back in your head. Be like, you know what? This guy was kind of like, you know, creeping me out for whatever reason, but your body already knew it. Cause you were like getting tense. You were getting some feeling in your stomach and later on your mind kind of catches on. So, uh, that's the skill and it, it's not easy, man. It's going to, it's going to take some fuck ups. So you're probably going to have some bad partnerships or some things go bad. Uh, I'll say one final thing, which is that last year I got involved in a business, which was just like such a mega disaster. And it just like, it like fucked me up, you know, like it, it was like really like a really negative thing in my life that like threw me, made me completely distrustful of people. Like I had to, you know, and then I, I went up north to Chiang Mai where I was uh, sort of taking a break from everything. And I remember the first day that I walked into the co-working space there, I was like just feeling massive anxiety. I was like, look at all these people here. Who are, who are like going to screw me. They're all going to screw. Like I was so like hostile and defensive, man. So, uh, this, you should take this stuff seriously because it's going to affect you. Um, it's going to affect your life. It's going to suck time and energy. There's a lot of massively manipulative, sociopathic, psychopathic people out there. You need to get really good at being honest with yourself and reading people and figuring out who are straight shooters that you want to work with. And then, um, trying to be committed to being fair that everybody is happy with what they're getting was that previous business uh a jv partnership as well uh yeah of sorts yeah damn that does sound that does sound hectic <laughs> so then to carry on uh down the same i guess topic that we're talking about now how do you find a partner to jv with and where do you find them man how did how did you and i hook up was it through facebook yeah, that was through a Facebook group. Like Facebook groups? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like just everywhere, look everywhere. Like you want a partner, don't you? Don't you? Okay, well, are you doing what is required? Are you doing what it takes to find like a good partner? Are you pounding the pavements? Or like, are you going on Upwork and Facebook, asking friends? Uh, like we partnered uh, and, and there, you know, it can come, a partner can come from anywhere. I think like we partnered with one of our customers because this is an example. One of our customers, uh, built this, uh, really great analytics tool for himself. And, uh, I was like, Oh, what is this? He's like, Oh, it's an analytics tool that I built for myself because this current platform doesn't have like a robust metrics and analytics tool. And I said, are you selling this? He's like, no, no, no I'm just using it for me. It's like, would you like to sell it? He's like, I don't know. I never thought about it. And then, you know, two weeks later, bada bing, bada boom is myself, uh, one of our, our software architect from our agency and our customer. We're incorporating an LLC in Wyoming and we're pulling the trigger on this SaaS business. So there's that. Um, and then you and I, we, we met through, uh, through Facebook because I was posting about this, uh, this niche site saying, Hey, I'm trying to develop it. I'm trying to give away some equity. Can we, I, I was basically looking for a good SEO who really knew his stuff who was hardworking and uh, conscientious and a straight shooter. And I, I talked with a lot of people and most of them were totally full of crap. And then I talked with you and I knew right away, 
um, that I wanted to work with you because you're a no nonsense guy. You're a real hard worker. You know, your stuff in SEO, you're relatable. You're just like a regular dude. And I was like, ah, James is legit. And then we kind of had our little trial period or whatever. And, and now we're doing a thing. So I think, I think it's amazing. I'll send you my bank account after this, uh, <clears throat> or you can send me your bank account after this and I'll, I'll pay you for that, uh, for that shout out and that pump up on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to touch on as well, when, when would you look to do a JV partnership? Like, because obviously most people are growing their sites, they're either growing it because they want to keep it for, um, I guess the income each month, or they want to eventually sell it to essentially cash out and make a couple of years income, you know, straight off the bat. So when do you decide between, Hey, I'm just going to sell this thing and get a lump sum of money, or I'm just going to JV with someone and have someone else run it and continue making money. Uh, well, I, I would say the general rule is that you don't ever want to give away equity unnecessarily in any business. Um, you, you, you would do that. Like if you can afford to pay somebody to run it and still be at profit, then that's kind of the ideal scenario. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's complicated bringing partners on board legally and, and otherwise. But if let's say you think the site has potential, but you don't have the time or the inclination to run it. Okay, then you can JV with somebody and say like, look, you'll get, you know, 50% or 60% even or, or more even. Um, I just want to, you know, derive some income from this site, but I don't have the time to run it. Why don't you run it and you'll keep most of it. And it's, you're getting in on a going thing. You know, it's not even a question like if it were, it already works. And that's a good pitch to somebody who's hungry and who understands that like, hey, I don't have to start from scratch. I don't have to get out of the sandbox, do all this crap. Like this is already making money or, or working. I just need to you know, scale it up, do, do the optimized, optimize the speed and the conversion rate and all that kind of stuff. So, um, for the right person, it, it's obvious that it's a good uh, opportunity. Um, and as far as selling it, I would say that. It really depends how you're getting your traffic. Like if you're highly reliant on Google and maybe you're attack, if, especially if you're attacking some kind of really uh, high competition um, keywords, or maybe it's something in, you know, a little bit gray hat, you basically want to like grow it and flip it as soon as possible because you don't want to do all that work and then your traffic gets tanked and then now you can't sell it anymore, you know, or you can't sell it for, for, for what it costs you to build it. So... I think with if you're monetizing like Google, YouTube, any of these algorithm based sort of situations, you kind of want to grow and flip. And then maybe you do a few grow and flips, which you can reinvest back into that same process. And then you can maybe attack something uh, like make like a proper site, you know, like a really proper authority site. Um, you know, the, you put a lot of effort into it. And maybe it's in an evergreen like a, what is it health wealth relationships niche that can actually grow big and you can have multiple traffic channels. You can have social, you can have YouTube, you have Google, um, Instagram, whatever. And that's like your long-term play as far as like actually growing it and deriving a recurring income versus just like, uh, grow and flip, grow and flip. So they're both totally legitimate. It also obviously depends if you need cash at a particular time. Um, just realize that you're also probably incurring a capital gain when you sell and that you're gonna have to pay taxes depending on where you are and um it's not so easy to sell things too and you got to pay fees and you're not going to get what you think you're going to get you're going to you're going to get like 20 percent less probably you need to plan your exit um you, you don't want to just wake up one day like, oh i want to sell my site and then you're just going to settle for a crappy deal now i think you make a good point there about not giving away equity you know unless you really really have to so i guess if you're making you know, if you're making more than full-time income with your site, maybe it's better to hire, say, you know, an SEO or site operator to run your site, you know, and then they can grow the site for you. So when you do flip, then you're obviously going to retain 100% of that, that sale, you know, instead of giving away, you know, 50 plus percent or whatever, and then losing out on a whole lot when you do sell it, especially if it's established. Yeah. And I guess one thing too, to, to keep in mind is that, um, it's probably not always the case, but it, I, I think like in our, in our collaboration, this is definitely the case, which is that when you, when you do give somebody equity or like when you offer them like a huge chunk of ownership, like they'll take it a lot more seriously, you know, whereas a lot of times you hire somebody, it's kind of, they're not really 
they're not invested in what you're doing. It's, 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 it doesn't feel like a company. It doesn't feel like a partnership. It's just like, oh, I'm a hired hand to maintain this uh, money machine for this guy. They're not going to take it as seriously. I, I mean, some of them will. I mean, pro a professional will, will do his job well. But, you know, like you and I working together, you know, you own the majority of the business. So you have the most motivation out of anybody to make sure that it fucking works and that it makes good money because, you know, you're putting in your, your time and expertise uh, at a disproportionate level. So, and then I have, and that's another thing with a partnership too, is I am then accountable to you because I need to make sure that I'm doing what, what I need to do to make sure that everything is legal and, and accounted. Um, and then our writer, uh, it's in your interest to make sure he's good and it's in his interest to make sure we're so there's a little bit of like an accountability um what would you call it circle there um which has a different flavor than just hiring people you know i think what might be interesting to go into as well because something that we've done with this partnership i guess you could say it's a little controversial in the fact that we've given equity to a writer so most people will say you know when you're having writers, just, just hire writers, you know, content's, you know, generally cheap or a little expensive, depending on what route you go down. But then, mm -hmm. so let, let's just cover, you know, why would you give a writer equity, you know, on your site? Or when would you decide to give equity versus just hiring? Yeah, so I, I would say that if, if you can hire somebody good, hire them and pay them. But I, I, I didn't want to go out of pocket anymore on this site. Like my... Uh, capital is committed to other investments that I think um, are probably har higher ROI. And I was like, and that's the thing, right? Who, who said this? Charlie Munger. Whatever money that you spend on an investment or, or put into whatever thing, uh, what is the opportunity cost? What what could that cash have done? Were it allocated more effectively? All right. So I'm like, okay, we've got this this. Um, this site that we're doing this content site but i don't want to put any more money into it because i feel that my return on investment putting it into other things you know crypto or whatever uh will be better will be a better use of capital and uh so i thought okay well we have this great writer who's a subject matter expert and um i know he's into other things so it's like how do we incentivize this guy to come collaborate with us because he knows his stuff he's like you know He's in the industry, he's in the space that we're doing. So uh, we could go and find other writers and then, you know, pay them out of pocket and then have to, you know, do all the accounting and stuff. They're not really, you know, they're going to be flaky and stuff. But we, we're telling this guy like, hey, man, you want like a quarter of this um, this business that we're doing? Here's what it, and we did like a calculation spreadsheet, right? Like here's what it could mean if we do a flip based on how much we're making. So this is how much you stand to make conservatively figuring this is how much you stand to make if we're being more uh, liberal about it and this is very motivating and, and we're giving I think it's a win-win and at the end of the day it has to be a win-win-win for all involved uh, I don't want to commit the capital okay so what does that mean it means we can't pay a writer we can't pay an SEO guy okay so let's give them the majority of the business and the opportunity and then and then make it happen that way so I think you know there's no right answer it depends on your life circumstances and what you value. But uh, yeah, generally, if you have the cash and you don't have better things to do with the cash, you should pay people uh, and not give away equity. But if you have like a, a potentially income generating asset that's just sitting there doing nothing, as was the case of this site, then maybe it makes sense to give away equity because you're going to be getting some percentage of something as opposed to zero all 100% of nothing. And that's a better deal. I think, you know? yeah, I, th so. I think it also depends as well. Like what you mentioned there is important is the fact there's the expertise, you know, that someone who's an expert in the space we're in, they can offer real value. You know, you're not going to offer, say, equity to a, you know, quote unquote, SEO writer, who is just a general writer that can essentially write for any topic, you know, that's just someone you're going to pay, you're, you're paying mm -hmm. for the expertise. Like I've seen even on Flipper, I've seen like a yoga site and they JV'd with some yoga professional who, you know, created all the videos and content in there. Um, an older site of yours that you showed me, which, you know, could potentially also have, you know, someone taking equity because, you know, they're an expert in the space. And I think that's a distinction that can be made where if you're going to go down that road, you know, 
get an expert to do it. So you're almost like they can be almost like the face of the brand totally. as well. Totally. Um, I, I think it was Dan Pena who said that the two biggest levers in business are other people's uh, other people and other people's money. So if you can partner with, uh, you know, other people, or if you get other people to finance your deals, um, you're not, I mean, you're risking, you're risking your time, I suppose, but you're, you're just not putting it as much at risk, but the upside for those people is still high and, um, you could do much bigger deals. And then what I also wanted to say was, yeah, cause you, cause you, I, th I suspect you were wanting me to say that about hiring the experts, but like, that is a really good membership model too, because we've. Uh, we've uh, served customers who they basically partner with experts. Um, I don't, I don't know what they pay them. I'm sure they just like negotiate whatever terms is appropriate to their situation. Like the crochet thing is a good example. They'll bring in like a crochet expert who will then like teach a class and then they'll, that expert will like mail their list, you know, and they'll do like a proper JV and work out all the terms and stuff. And that's a great way to grow a site. Like you don't even need to have a single crochet expert on your team, you just outsource the expertise and you're essentially the, the marketer. And I think that's the distinction is like, this is marketing and sales. Uh, it's not doing the thing, you know, uh, if you happen to do the thing and you also want to teach it too, that's cool. Like as in your case with your fitness websites, uh, that's really cool, but you don't have to. No, that, that's, that's a very good point. Like there's a, there's a couple of good sites within I guess you could say within the strength and conditioning niche where, you know, they have a membership, but each month it's a different professional that's presenting. So obviously they'll get paid or whatever, but then they're outsourcing to different people and essentially building a big network within, you know, within the membership. So the members get exposed to someone different all the time. And that means you're not having to do, you mm -hmm. know, do all the work, but you're getting a lot of the expertise done from you. You're, you know, improving your own network. Um, you know, helping out people in the industry as well. And I think as well, when people looking to hire expert or get experts to JV with or, or be part of their project, I think people underestimate, like most people within the industries don't know about this stuff, like about this online, I guess, online business world. So for example, like I only mm -hmm. found this world like say two years ago. Before that I was, I was doing a lot of coaching and things like that, but I had no idea. Like no idea how to do this online stuff. No idea you could make, you know, money online doing this, doing these things. So if you're able to find an expert that you could partner with and you can be like, hey, we're going to offer you, you know, whatever it is, percentage, you know, you can grow your revenue XXX and all you need to do is essentially doing what you're doing now, but you're just acting as the marketer, you know, that could be an, an easy way to, you know, also sort of a JV uh, deal as well. 100%. Well, thank, thanks for coming on, Vic. Really appreciate your time. Is there uh, anywhere where people can find you, visit your website, your social media, anything like that? Sure, you can find us at memberfix.rocks. Memberfix.rocks. That's a very uh, different TLD at the end of that. Oh, yeah. Well, I was trying to buy the .com, and the dude wanted, like, a G. <laughs> and... Uh, I just thought, fuck you, I don't need your dot com, and and we got the dot rocks and it works just fine. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Well, thank you, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it, and I'll chat to you soon. Yeah, man. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you're listening. Until the next episode, goodbye.